Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to our 12th session. And this is a very important session. This is the session where we start talking about the proofs of God's existence. We'll start, inshallah ta'ala, with the recitation of the poem of Londoniya, and then we'll come back and do a sharh or an explanation of this poem. Fadal. ودل بالإتقان فالإتقان على الذي أتقنه برهان بيانها كما أقول فاسمعي مرتبا كما مضى وأسمع فالسببية تقول كل ما له ابتداء فسبب له انتماء وكوننا هذا له بداية إذا بدا سببه كالراية والسبب يكون بالمسبب بذا أقر كل ملحد غبي دليل تركيب يقول الكون مجزأ وجزؤه يكون مفتقرا لغيره ومفتقر إليه عقلا إليه عقلا قد يكون مفتقر فيحصل التسلسل المحال عقلا لأنه له المآل وقد يكون الغير ذا اغتناء وذلك الحي وذو البقاء جل جلاله وعز شانه وفي الكتاب جاءنا بيانه وصفة تنفك أو تزول والجزء لا يميل أو يحول أما الدليل الثالث الإتقان فالحال لا يسعفه البيان فالكون ذا مهيئا لكل نوع من الحياة مستقل فما أجل خلقه سبحانه وكم نرى في كونه إتقانه فالشمس في فلكها المعلوم تسيره بالضبط كل يوم وقمر يسير في مساره وكلهم يقر في قراره لو لم يكن ذا الخلق والإتقان دليل صانع فلا برهان So in that piece, uh, that poetry, there's a lot of discussion uh, We're going to start with Ibn Sina's Burhan and which was also mentioned there, and then we're going to proceed. This is going to be a series in and of itself, a series within a series of five different uh, episodes, hopefully, five different sessions, where we discuss basically some of the major contingency arguments um, for God's existence. And that includes cosmological arguments, it includes ontological arguments, it includes some of the main arguments that have ever been made in history to prove God's existence. Before we start this though, uh, it's important to have a note on Islamic philosophy because this has become somewhat a subject of contention. And uh, some people say, well, why are you mixing you know, philosophy and the religion? And isn't this something which has been prohibited? And they will bring forward some, some of the, you know, a quail of the Salaf, uh, which I, in my uh, estimation reading, is a misappropriation. Like they will, for example, say the Ahl Kalam, uh, are X, Y, Z, but obviously in their, in their understanding, the Ahl Kalam at that time, at the time of a Shafi'i, for example, were the proto Mu'tazilites. You know, the Mu'tazilism actually wasn't even formed at that time. Mu'tazilism wasn't even formed at that time. So it couldn't even, it certainly couldn't have been talked about Ash'arism because that wasn't even a school of thought at that time. Abu al Hassan al Ash'ari wasn't around. Uh, and so uh, we have to be very clear. When we're talking about philosophy, we are not talking about something which we are bringing, importing into the religion of Islam in order to change the religion of Islam. Because we believe that Islam is a perfect religion. Today I have completed your religion and I have perfected my favor upon you and I have ordained Islam as the religion for you. So Islam is perfect, it's muqtamal, it's kamil, it's completely, it's, it's no requirement for anything to be put into it or taken out of it. And so when we are talking about philosophy, we are talking, or when we use it, in fact, we, we talk about it or use it for two primary reasons. Reason number one is instrumentally, meaning we use it as an instrument to bring people to Islam. We use it as an instrument to bring people to Islam because people that are not Muslim, they don't accept the Quran and they don't accept the Sunnah as a source of inspiration or, or divine inspiration. So you can't speak to someone who's a uh, disbeliever and say the Qur'an states X, Y, Z because this would be a foolish move. You'll say, I don't believe in the Qur'an. So you have to bring them to the Qur'an without using the Qur'an in order to avoid the circularity. Likewise, we also use philosophy for deconstruction. And that's what we've been doing in the previous uh, 11 sessions. So we, we use philosophy as an instrument to bring people to Islam and as a means to break down systems which are un-Islamic. Because you can't use, or oh, because Allah and the Prophet said it, to someone who doesn't believe in Allah and the Prophet. We have to show them from within their own principles or from within logical principles, or whatever it may be, that what they believe is false. So we can, it is, it is a vantage point um, which is not 
religious, we can both appreciate this vantage point. So just to be very clear, very clear, when we use philosophy or kalam or whatever it may be, it's for two primary reasons. One, to bring people to Islam, and one, to demolish or deconstruct things which are un-Islamic. These are the two reasons. Now, let's be open and honest. Some people from, let's say, uh, Salafi and Athari, especially uh, perspective, will have particular problem with this. By the way, some Ash'aris had issues with this as well. Uh, even though in most of the books of uh, the Ash'ari creed and the Maturidi creed, they, they refer to something as awul nadar, uh, awul wajib nadar. The, the, the first obligation is another which is uh, systematic uh, analysity or if you call it um, uh, dialectic theology or you know that in fact they state that the first thing you have to do is a wajib as an obligatory action is to to think about what the truth is from outside a religious paradigm to use logical principles to and Ibn Taymiyyah disagreed with this he said you don't need to do that because in fact you have the fitrah and this was a classic discussion between Ibn Taymiyyah and, uh, and Fakhruddin al-Razi, where Ibn Taymiyyah say, stated that you don't actually need to do awul wajib and nadar because you're born with an instinct to believe in God. And we've already spoken about that. The instinct to believe in God is something which is super rational. It's like, as Ibn Taymiyyah himself mentioned, when the baby is born, it has an instinct to suck the breast of the mother. Now, this is an instinct. You don't need to rationalize that. You don't need to think about that. And to be fair, a cognitive behavioral uh, science or co cognitive science has proven uh, to a great extent that in fact we do have this instinct. And I, I'm not sure if you remember the first lesson we've done on epistemology and I quoted something from Justin Barrett where in fact he mentions the Islamic fitrah itself. He mentions it by name in his book in 2011. And he says that there is evidence for it, basically. He mentions Islam as a religion and he mentions the fitrah and he says there is evidence for it because he's done this big... Uh, you know, this um, study, 32,000 uh, 32, um, uh, participants, children, and he's, he questioned them and, and uh, him and the other people that were involved in the study. And in fact, it's true that b babies are born or children are born believing in a higher power. That's a, that's a truth now. And they don't, they don't require any evidence for this at all. Just like a child does not require any evidence to know where to suck the breast or we don't need any evidence to know that a candle being put on the hand of a person will cause them pain. So in a, in a very kind of um, straightforward sense, you, say, you, can, you can argue that we don't need any arguments for the existence of God. That believing in God is something which is supra-rational, something which comes uh, like that. But we can't say to someone who's inquiring that just because we have an instinct to believe in God, therefore God exists, because this could be the isot fallacy itself, or naturalistic fallacy. And these fallacies are slightly different, by the way, but they are very similar. You know, so we, we, that's not a demonstrative way to prove God's existence. We can just end there. We can we say we don't need to prove God's existence because why? Why do we need to prove God's existence when we have an instinct for it? Just like we have an instinct for X, Y, and Z. It's an intuition. It's an it, we intuit this feeling of believing in God. We don't need, but. Some people you'll need to. And Ibn Taymiyyah, interestingly, he states the following, and I've taken this from his book, ar ala al or uh, a reply to Aristotelian logic, let's call it. al Mantiqiyin here is talking specifically about Aristotelian Greek logic. And it's been translated by Wa'il Halak, who's a Christian uh, Arab. And Ibn Taymiyyah states the following. He says, some people, every time the proof is more explicated and detailed, with more logical premises, it was more useful to them and this is the kind of person one should use a detailed kalam approach or any other such uh, analytic approach which they would be uh, used to. So here Ben Taymi is saying, actually, uh, you should use this approach. And I, I did a trick one time on some of the... I'm not sure if you... Uh, I put this down. I said one of my shiuch, uh, one of the of mine, his name is Sheikh Ahmed. He said, uh, he said this, and I translated it just like this put it on Twitter, and some people from, you know, the far-right uh, Salafist uh, Madkhalite movement started attacking this quote from the Sheikh. said, look, this is a mubtada, this is a, a this person's a dal mudil, this person is a, um, uh, a deviant, and so on. Who is the Sheikh Ahmed anyway? We need to know who he's taking knowledge from. Has he taken it from Sheikh Rabia al-Madkhali? 
and so on. And, and they kept going. And I just let them keep keep going, keep going. And then I revealed his full name is, you know, Sheikh Ahmed Ibn Taymiyyah, basically his full name. And so, and so, so it was like, you know, it was, it was a bit of an embarrassment for them. Some of them knew who it was in the first place. But this is a, a definitive proof that Ibn Taymiyyah's position was not that you cannot use philosophy. It was, it's a definitive proof. And by the way, there are so many of these quotes. This is for me one of the, the clearest ones. But if you want, and we can get a whole, you know. Because it's important that we start with this preamble. People will say, why are you using philosophy? So, well, look at Ibn Taymiyyah saying it here. Ibn Taymiyyah continued. Ibn Taymiyyah, he's wrote a book called Mas'alat Hadooth Al-Alam. And this uh, is actually, it means the issue of the universe, how it started. And then he's, he's talking about what evidences can be used and what evidences cannot be used. And he says something really interesting. And this is important for if you want to relate Islam to other people. These detailed arguments that we're going through today, the majority of people, A, do not need them. And number two, will not understand them. This is very important, okay? Because the lay person doesn't need this, okay? It's, it's a, a, a person of a certain level of intelligence, a certain level of academic ability, maybe an analytic background that will require this. Ibn Taymiyyah states, after the, you know, the verse, Am min shayin amul khaliqun, you know, were they created from nothing or, or are they themselves the creators of themselves? He said, this categorization, this categorization is the easiest and clearest way that one can reason the existence of a creator with the most minimal amount of introspection. This is because the slave knows that he once did not exist and then he came into existence after he did not exist. Yani, the, the, the verse says, Am min ghayri shay. Were, you, were they created from nothing? So there was nothing and then there was something. Okay, yeah, I understand that. It's very, very clear for anybody to know that something cannot come from nothing. Yani, is in history, in the history of philosophy, um, a few have dared, only a few have dared to go against this proposition because something, nothing is the absence of something. And it's not a serious postulation to make that something can come from nothing. Okay, and we will, this is one of the objections. We will, re, we will um, deal with it in the lesson five, actually. And then it says, he also knows that he did not create himself or bring himself into existence. Likewise, you can say the same thing about the universe. The universe did not create itself and it did not bring itself into existence. And he saw it didn't come from nothing. Okay, so the universe did not come from nothing. Okay, so the universe did not create itself. What other options do we have? There's a third option, which is that the universe was always there, which is the eternal option. But even then, what is it dependent on? Because, de and we'll come to this, dependency and causation are two, uh, two different things. Therefore, it will lead to an understanding of there's an ultimate independent. The cause or the, the thing that everything is dependent upon, which is, and that's the third and most understood option. This is really where you, need to, where you can stop. I mean, you can speak to a person in the street and say, did you come from nothing? Did the universe come from nothing? They say yes or no. Um, did, they, uh, did the universe create itself? It can't. They can't. It's like a mother, like Hamza Zulza says, it's like a mother giving birth to herself. A mother cannot give birth to herself. The universe cannot give birth to itself or cannot incept itself. It cannot preponderate itself. It cannot come into existence in this manner. And so these, this is the second option. Therefore, the third option is quite easy to come by, you know. And this kind of approach is much simpler, people will understand it, than anything we're ever going to say after this point. <laughs> you see, it's, it, I'm just letting you know. But we need to be able to know the high-level arguments as well, because nowadays, uh, you know, people are going to uh, argue in a way which requires proper refutation. And the new atheist movement is already on the decline. And we need to make sure it stays that way. Okay, and this is how we do it. So, in terms of the schedule, there's going to be five lessons and a lesson for just role-playing. Okay? The five lessons are going to be this. First lesson is the review of Ibn Sina's argument. So, today we're just going to look at Avicenna or Ibn Sina. Avicenna is the English or a Latinized way of saying Ibn Sina. Like Avi Rose is the Latinized way of saying Ibn Rushd. These are just, they've changed the name, Latinized them. But they can be used interchangeably. Lesson two is the reactions of medieval scholars. And in that in particular, we're going to focus on Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Rushd, Al-Ghazali, Thomas Aquinas, and Dan Scotus. These are five. Uh, but, of course, there are some, we're going to make reference 
to Ar-Razi At-Tawsi, who's a Shi'i, by the way, but he also wrote a commentary on it, Ibn, Ibn Sina's uh, book, one of his books. We're going to mention, uh, we're, go we're going to briefly mention Maimonides, who's a Jew as well, just so you can get a flavor of what's going on out there. But these five we're going to focus on. So the five that I've mentioned, we're going to focus on them. The others, we will mention them uh, briefly. But these five, I think, are the most important for you to know. Um, and then after that, we're going to look at other kinds of rendition of the argument. So and this is where we're going to contemporary discussion. So we're going to look at Leibniz. We're going to look at Plantinga. We're going to look at William Lane Craig's argument. We're going to look at what's out there in the field of uh, philosophy of religion. And we're going to see what are the advantage or the weak strengths and weaknesses of these approaches. Some other things that have been written recently as well. Rasmussen, uh, Alex Pruss, Alexander Pruss, and others. Yani. And then we're going to, I'm going to pro produce my own renditions of the argument, which has gone through some, uh, some serious uh, um, you know, amendment process. Uh, just for your knowledge, what happened is uh, I started off in Soaz. This was a year ago, and I, I did a particular course called Arab Medieval Thought with a professor called Eamon Shihada. And he was brilliant. He was absolutely like, he's the one who really introduced me to the whole Ibn Sina argument thing, right? Uh, and then after that, I started to get more engrossed into it. I had an awareness of it, but the way he presented it was something special. So I wanted to look more into it. So we, I continued just producing essays for him and then they went well. I put them together and I made the first book that I've written called Kalam Cosmological Arguments. And that book was used, or the arguments in that book were, were used in debates I then had with atheists like Edward Tabash with, in the Oxford debate, uh, Oxford debate with the um, uh, uh, cosmic uh, skeptic and the other old man, I can't remember his name. And um, <laughs> sorry to say, uh, so th these arguments come from, from that. They, they, um, they, they come from that. So I, then also, again, I've used it in the academic world, speaking to different professors who are in the, involved in the philosophy of religion. So they've been battle tested. These arguments have been battle tested both in written work and on the ground. And so one then I went to University of Oxford, and what you just read there for 20, 20 pages or whatever, I spent a good a couple more years uh, looking at the argument again and produced my 20,000-word dissertation on that, which is what will then become a pamphlet book, the Burhan argument uh, book. And, uh, and so it went through again, a revision process, and looked again, and you know, it, the, the basic argument never changed. But looking at objections in a different way, looking at the history in a different way, what you call historical exegesis. And so my PhD is on this, is on this, is on the contingency argument. So in many ways, I've decided to specialize on this argument, you know. Um, and so that's why I feel like if I'm bringing my own kind of renditions of the argument, not from Farah or from the fact that I've, but this is, this is the academic uh, route I aim to pursue. And so it's already been through different um, avenues and so on. And in lesson five, we'll look at some of the objections of the argument. Uh, the, some of them you would have heard before, we would go through and really I'm going to focus on five major objections. Things like the infinite regress objection, things like uh, the universe just is objection, things like, um, you know, the universe from nothing objection, um, the composition fallacy, which is a big one, it's a big one, and we'll, we'll talk about those objections and how much they apply or don't apply to the argument um, that we're going to be putting forward. And then after that, on the sixth lesson, is going to be just role play. So you would have had enough information now. Uh, we would have made it succinct, and you would have had the nutshell argument. Then you just, we're going to split the class up. And we, we, we will probably will be doing these role plays before the sixth lesson, but it's the, the sixth lesson will just be dedicated to that. We're just going to be role playing. So one's going to be the atheist, and one's going to be the theist. And one's gonna and you and these arguments, by the way, there are variations of them. So you can choose which one you prefer, which one you enjoy, which one you like, which one you think will work. And the other one will try an objection. They'll research an objection. They'll try it, and it will be this is getting a flavor of actually how to debate these things. So this is the schedule. The first um, thing I want to do now then is in terms of Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina was a Persian philosopher. Uh, he lived a very uh, ignoble and impious life. You know, he's, he's not, you know, he was known for his arrogance. <laughs> uh, in fact, his student in his autobiography would tell him, it would say things like, you know, he'd go out at night to the, you know, the, the bar, have the drink. Because he was, a, he was, as you know, he wrote 
he, he wrote the canon, the med medical canon. He was one of the pioneers in writing a book. In the, he was a genius. He was an absolute genius, yeah? One of the world's leading geniuses in history. Genii is the plural, actually, he, in history. And he um, went in the nighttime. Uh, he would go and, and, you know, drink alcohol and so on. In fact, he died. Uh, he, it was said that he would commit adulterous, uh, sorry, fornication, you know, so I don't know if he was married or not. Fornication and, you know, I don't know if he was confession, it was a confession or not, but if he's not a Muslim, then, you know, it's, it's not, we can be more liberal with these uh, kinds of accusations. And uh, and so he would go and, <laughs> and he would go and he would do, a part, according to their standards, you know, you don't need four witnesses or anything like that. He would go at night time and drink and this and that. And, like, for example, in his autobiography or the, or the biography that his student wrote about him, they would say things like, you know, he was, um, he was a ladies' man. You know, he likes to chirp the ladies. He likes to move to them. You know, maybe he was red pill. I don't know. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he would go there and this and that. And at night time, he would be with them, drink the alcohol. And, and in fact, he had an ailment. And but he would say that, you know, it was um, like he had an excuse, a medical excuse. Because remember, he was a doctor, so he can give himself the excuse, you know. But he was a serious doctor. And in fact, when he was talking about doctor, uh, being a doctor, he said, like, you know, I mastered this uh, medicine. I mastered it very quickly. It was one of the easy sciences, like one of the easy sciences. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, but he was certainly a, a, a giant in terms of uh, his contribution. And the thing that really differentiated Ibn Sina from the rest of his peers was that he didn't just stick like Ibn Rushd arguably did. He didn't just stick to Aristotelian logic. He didn't just stick to that. He questioned Aristotelian logic. Like, what, what you need to know is that there was an Arab translation movement some 300 years after the Prophet's death. So a lot of the Greek works were translated, tra translated into uh, Arabic. And so that's where Mu'tazili, for example, they got a lot of their inspiration from Aristotelian logic. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher who existed in the Hellenistic period, died in 323 BC. And he wrote many books formalizing the laws of logic, the law of non-contradiction, the law of this uh, exclu excluded middle, these laws, you know, modus ponens, modus tonens. He wouldn't mention it; they wouldn't call it that. But these, he formalized those laws in books like Organon and so on. So when this stuff was translated into Arabic, people were getting really excited, especially Martezilis, using it to you now for you know reasoning and this and that. But uh, if Avicenna was no sucker for Aristotelian. He was in many ways an Aristotelian because he accepted the basic framework, but he was um, he wouldn't accept that this is the be all and end all. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah tried to challenge like Aristotelian logic. Like he wrote a book at attacking it, uh, saying that there's a problem here and this, uh, and this was Avicenna was the same. He 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 didn't accept the full paradigm of Aristotelian logic. He went be f beyond that, and so he was he's a bit different from his contemporaries. This art is, where do we get the arguments from? The source material, really, there's three or four books which you need to know where this came from. Now, these books are not translated into English. Not all of them are, at least. Uh, what I think I've written here is, trans I've def I don't know if I'm the first person to translate this or not, but this is, you should consider yourself very lucky that you've uh, read the, what you read before the beginning of this session, you know, because I don't know, you can get this translation anywhere. Uh, I don't think it's actually uh, available. Anyway. Having said that, this comes from a book called An Najat. And An Najat is, is a book basically where he talks about all kinds of things like mathematics. He talks about logic. So he br breaks down this is how logic is done, this is how mathematics is done. So back in the days, what they used to do was they used to put all the, the, the ulum into one book. It's referred to sometimes as a summa. So they would put natural philosophy, a tabi'ayat, which is science, mathematics, a riyadiyat. Or hisab, mathematics, they would put al ilahiyat. Ilahiyat does not mean God, uh, it means metaphysics. The word ilahiyat means metaphysics. Yeah? Why is it called ilahiyat? Um, I don't know. Yeah. But it's, ilahiyat means metaphysics, things which are metaphysical. And uh, so, so they put that all in one book. This is called the Summa, which was why, like, if you read what Al Ghazali wrote in, in, in Munqid bin al Dalal, I believe it was Munqid al He says that I was able to kind of exhaust the information about philosophy in two years. And you could never say that today. It's impossible for you to say that today. How could you exhaust the information about philosophy in two years unless the, the information was very 
limited in the first place. And so the source material was very limited. You can read Aristotle and, and you can read like the Greek philosophers and you can do that in two, if you can do that in two years and you imagine the, the kind of high energy motivation that Al-Ghazali had for it, maybe put in 12 hours a day or something, maybe more, 13, 14 hours a day. This is what you can imagine, right? Reading at a fast pace, trying to understand it, thinking about it. These kind of two years is still significantly a short space of time. So that's how you can explain the fact that you can have encyclopedic knowledge at that time in a, yeah, in a short pace, a space of time. What we're looking at now, so the, the book and Najat is where he, I think he expounds the argument in the most full way. Although in Ash-Shifa, Ash-Shifa is another book that he wrote. He expands on it good. And there's a very small book which he writes called The Pointers and Reminders, which is Al-Isharat wa Tanbihat. So this, the three major books which you can look at where you'll find the arguments of God's existence with Ibn Sina, the three primary source materials, Al-Isharat wa Tanbihat, or The Pointers and the Reminders, Ash-Shifa, which is referred to as the cure, and Al-Najat, which is like the deliverance, the deliverance. Yeah. So what we're going to be doing now, I'm going to read... One half of the argument, we're going to discuss it, and we're going to come back, and we'll see what you guys understand from it, and we'll do the same thing with the other half of the argument. So <clears throat> here's what he states. He says, there is no doubt that there is existence. You might have heard me say that in a debate or something. I started a debate like this one time, actually, with Edward Tabash. I stood up, I said, there is no doubt that there is existence. That's how I started the debate. He's copy and paste. It's not, uh, I'm not a genius, you know. There's no doubt who's going to argue with you, right? And I want to say something. It's very important. Uh... Descartes, René Descartes, he said, I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. You might have heard this before. It is the basis of the rationalist school of thought in the Western world. Before him here, you have Ibn Sina saying there is no doubt that there is existence. Nietzsche said, in attacking Descartes, why do you presuppose I? He said, why do you presuppose that I think, therefore I am? Here, look at this. Ibn Sina anticipates this kind of objection. And he doesn't even personalize with a personal pronoun I think, therefore I am. So he says, there is no doubt that there is existence. Abstracting, therefore, the, pro or the pronoun from the equation. There is no doubt that there is existence. Everything that is, exists is either contingent or necessary. Contingent means it needs something else in order for it to exist, or it could be conceived of in another way. And by the way, this word contingent or mumkin, we're going to define it properly because, in fact, there is some level of controversy as to what it means. So contingent means that it is, uh, you could say one of the definitions of it is that it is destructible, generatable or destructible. Something that can be put into creation or out of creation. This is Ibn Rushd's preferred understanding of what a contingent mumkin thing is. It's generatable or destructible. An additional thing what, um, what contingent or mumkin could mean is that something which, which has a beginning, has been caused, but this is a cause-based contingency, and we're going to differentiate between cause-based contingency and non-cause-based contingency. But it could also mean something which could be conceived of in another way, and we'll explain what that means. But all three of those definitions are, have been used to define what mumkin is. Whereas wajib is something that could not be any other way, it's independent. And so he's, he, he said, everything that exists is either contingent or necessary. Wajib. Mumkin or wajib. If it is necessary, then the pursuit of the necessary existence is complete. Because remember, the objective is to find the necessary existence. So now if you're saying the thing is necessary, then the, complete, uh, the, the objective is done. If it is contingent, I'll make it clear that the con this contingent existence will ultimately return back to a necessary existence. He's saying this. You can't just have contingent existences. You can, you, contingent existences must revert back to a necessary existence. Before this, I'll present premises to prove this thesis. So, okay, let's see what premises he's talking about. What is a premise? Just ask. How would you define a premise? An underlying proposition based on which you're making an argument. Very nice. What did you get there? You memorized that from, huh? <laughs> How many premises do you need to make an argument? At least what? At least one. At least one premise. At least one. If you look at some people think you need a three, like you need three premises, like uh, premise one, premise two, and conclusion. But but yeah, that's what people think. But actually, if you look at just the basic book of logic, for example, 
Hulbach's book, which is what they recommend if you do like philosophy or something like that in Oxford or Cambridge, for example. Uh, it's called the, the Handbook of Logic. They say, he says that it's only, you only require one premise. In fact, Ghazali says the same thing. You only need one muqaddima. You only need one premise in order to make an argument. Yeah? Among these premises is the assertion that it is impossible for an infinite rigorous of causes to account for a contingent existence. That is because all contingent existences either all exist at once or do not all exist at once. If they all exist at once, they are infinite, one preceding the other. We will deal with this matter in another section of the book. We'll, we'll deal with this matter. So he's basically saying this. If you have contingent existences, they're either finite or what? Infinite. You either, if they're either finite things which are contingent, which exist, or an infinite number of things which are contingent and exist. He's saying, okay, we'll deal with both, yeah? If they are all together and there is no necessary existence in the set, we find that upon, upon exhaustive uh, analysis and whether or not the set is finite or uh, infinite, the set of contingent things can either be composed of contingent things or necessary things. He's saying, in mathematics and in logic, you have something called set theory. What is a set? Because we're going to keep talking about the set. What is a set? A set is where you're describing a number of things. So, for example, if I say, I'm going to talk about the set of tables in this room. Now, you've got table one, table two, table three, table four, table five. How many tables have we got? Five. So, how many tables are in the set? Five tables. Now, what does this set of five tables not include? Chairs. Chairs, Chairs books. You know, we have books here, right? So when we talk about, for example, the set of contingent things, what does it necessarily exclude? Necessary. necessary things, right? He's saying, look, if you have a set, if you have a set now, and you have only contingent things inside of it, then this excludes the fact that you can have a necessary thing inside of it, because it's a set of contingent things. It's a very straightforward thing to say, actually. If in the set there is a necessary existence... Now, he's saying something which is impossible, but he, he, he does this all the time. He says, he argues it's called argumentum ad absurdum. Yeah, which is that, let's just get, let's assume that you have a set which is filled with contingent things, and let's assume also that there's a necessary thing, even though that's impossible. He's going to say it's impossible. Even though it's impossible for the necessary thing to be in that set, let's assume it's in there, no problem. He said that the necessary thing will therefore explain all the contingent things in the set. If, there's a, if it's somehow the case that you can have a set of tables, but you have a chair in it, then the chair, if in this case, the necessary existence explains the tables. Well, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be like that with contingent and contingent things, but with necessary and contingent things, it's like that. Because a necessary thing is a thing where all things depend upon it, or it depends upon nothing, or, or, or it's non-reliant, it's self-sufficient. So if you have something which is self-sufficient in a set of things which are reliant, then, it would, then that would be the cause of all things which are... Reliant. He's saying if somehow it's possible that you have something which is necessary in a set of contingent things, then that's, that thing which is necessary, which is inside the thing, the set of uh, contingent things, would be the expl explainer of the things which is necessary or uh, contingent. Yeah. Is it sort of like saying a set full of photos and then you've got a camera in there? Would that be that's a good analogy that's actually not bad right in a, in a way but it, it's, it's limited in a sense because whenever it's contingent to contingent it's always going to be limited because the idea is that the contingent is in many ways antithetical to the necessary but in many it's a good analogy for contingent and contingent it's, it's, it's difficult to uh, to make a perfect analogy for that um, then he continues sorry one sec If the set is composed of only contingent existences, then it requires that which supplies existences. This can either be in the set or contingent, or uh, sorry, of contingent existences, or outside the set. If it's inside the set, then it already has been elaborated upon. So he's saying, look, if if you've got the necessary existence within the set of contingent things, then we've already explained that that's going to be explaining all the contingent things. Now, it's, if it's outside the set, so you've got a set of contingent things. Okay, and you have something which is outside the set, which is necessary. Right? Now he's going to say, or it could be that the contingent existence, uh, sorry, 
Or it could be that the, uh, it is a contingent existence such that it is the cause of the set. And the cause of the set is by extension the cause of all the constituent parts. So if you have a necessary part, if a necessary existence outside the set of contingent existences, it's going to be the cause of that a contingent a set of contingent existences. And if it's the cause of the set of contingent existences, it's a set, it's, if it's the cause of the set, it's the cause of everything inside the set. If it's the cause of the set, it's the cause of everything inside the set. Yeah. For example, you'll, you'll be only paid if you do, do, do these, these things. So the payment's contingent on the work. Yeah, in that, yeah. Only yeah. Paid you do this. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like you got this. You got the thing necessary existence outside the set. If it if it caused the set, then it caused what else? It caused everything inside the set, right? So you say caused and depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caused. Yeah, he he says both. Caused and depends on. Yeah. <laughs> right, but if it's like inside the set, you can't say that it caused. He says if it's inside the set, it would also be caused. Right. It's in both situations because. It's the only thing which is non-reliant, and everything else is reliant. And the first one is impossible, did he say? If it's in the set, is that impossible? Or well, he was just arguing from ad absurdum, is that what he said? Yeah, he, he says it's impossible. Okay. I'm not sure if it's in this, uh, in this part here, but he definitely says that's impossible. Yeah. Mathematically, it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, yani, if you just go and research set theory, if you have a set of odd numbers, you can't... If, you, if I say I have a set of odd numbers, what can't be in that set? Even numbers. Even numbers. Even numbers. It's the same thing. If I have a set of contingent things, what can't not be in that set? That's Necessary things. It's as simple as that. It's impossible. But he's saying just, just for the sake of argument. Even if you had an odd number in there, he's saying basically, kind of thing. <laughs> By the way, set theory is an important part of logic. You might not be good at maths, and I'm not good at maths, but you have to know a bit of set theory. You know, that's... Or it could be that the contingent existence, uh, that it is a contingent existence such that it is the cause of the set. And the cause of the set is by extension the cause of all the constituent parts. If it, if it is inside the set or the set itself, even though this is impossible, yeah, he does say that, right? This line of argumentation could still be valid. So from one perspective then, one, uh, one will have been fulfilled, one have, one have fulfilled the object in making this conclusion, i.e. because this would have proven the existence of a necessary existence. This is because anything that is self-sufficient, i.e. the set in question, is a necessary existence. And the necessary existence cannot uh, be this. It is also impossible that contingent existences can exist outside the set. Yeah, this is important. So he's saying, look, you've got the set, and it's got all contingent existences inside of it. You can't have a necessary existence inside, it's impossible. But let's say for the sake of argument, it's in there. If it's in there, it explains all of them. If it's not in there, then it also explains all of them. If you say that there's only contingent existences, this is where it gets... So there's no necessary existence, only contingent existences. He's saying then, you're saying that the set is itself the necessary existence because the set is self-sufficient. Think about this for a second. He's saying that, what is, the, what is the definition of a necessary existence? Something which doesn't need... It depends on itself. Because you, you can have something which is dependent or independent. If you say to somebody... You have a set of contingent existences, yeah? Can that set of contingent existences exist by itself? And if they say yes, th and they say, therefore, it depends on itself. Mm -hmm. If it depends on itself, what does that mean? It's independent. Yes. What he's showing is it's impossible to run away from the idea that something independent exists. And something independent is self-sufficient, which means it relies on nothing else. You see the point, yeah? So he's saying even if you wanted to have just a set of contingent existences, it's impossible for that to... Uh, but he obviously, and we'll, we'll come to this, he argues from composition that it's impossible for something to be independent and composed of different parts, which is an important um, corollary to this um, argument. It's because anything that is self-sufficient, i.e. the set in question, is a necessary existence. And the necessary existence cannot be this. It is also impossible that a contingent existence uh, that a contingent existence can exist outside the set. We said the set includes all of the contingent existences. That means that nothing out, nothing which is contingent can be outside that set. Likewise, if I say I have a set of even numbers, no non-even number can be outside that set. It incl includes all the even numbers up to infinity and beyond. You know. 
did that remind you of some uh, Toy Story or something like that? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and the necessary existence cannot be uh, this. It's also impossible that a contingent existences can exist outside the set, as a set is by definition a collation of all contingent existences. Therefore, it, the supplier of existence, the supplier of existence, yeah, must be outside of it as well as necessary in essence. Thus, the set of contingent existences has culminated in the need for a necessary existence outside of the set in order to explain it. It is not the case that every contingent effect has a contingent cause as a matter of infinite regress. Now, I want you to um, apply this to the universe or the multiverse. Now, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Nowadays, if we're, if we're putting this in action, yeah, people are not going to be talking about sets. We're going to be talking about universes and multiverses. Someone's going to come and say, well, the universe could have been there forever, or that the universe is all that there is. Or they're going to say that the, there's an infinite multiverses, an infinite amount of universes. That's how we explain the, 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 um, how we are in our existence. Except. So using this argument, how would you counteract that claim? That there's an infinite amount of multiverses. Yeah, before we feedback, I'll give you um, five minutes to think about that with the person next to you, you know, to discuss that with the person next to you. And then after that, we can discuss it, inshallah. Yeah? Also, uh, you mentioned the names. We have an infinite amount of thinking set, right? Is that possible? He doesn't think so. He, no. He doesn't think so, no. Yeah, so, so if somebody else argues that there's an infinite number of contingent things, contingent things, so then the whole set goes out of the way. Yeah, but he's going to argue uh, through composition why that's not the case. But that's not the case. Yeah, there's another argument we haven't presented yet. Yeah, Guys, this is just one of two parts of the argument, okay? So there are, this is one part of the argument. There's a second part of the argument which is as important, which is going to help this argument. But we want to get this part right first. Because that, that question relates to um, what you said. The universe is a self All right, guys, are you ready? Yes, I plugged it in. Um, before I get your contribution, I'm going to tell you the argument in a nutshell. This is my summary of the argument, yeah? Ibn Sina's Burhan argument. This is referred to as Burhan as siddiqin The evidence of the truthful. That's what the name of the argument is. And by the way, this argument has never been packaged for apologetic purpose in the philosophy of religion. Obviously, until now. Until I have dealt with it and, uh, you know... <laughs> Yes, so this is uh, going to be, this is a book that's coming, uh, the, the 20 pages that I gave you is the first 20 pages of a book that's coming out for Sapiens, and it's important for me to let you know. This, this is part of the book, actually, so I'm going to read it. The argument in a nutshell. Ibn Sina's Burhan argument goes as follows. There is existence. Existence is of three types, possible, which is contingent, necessary, and impossible. Impossible existences, like squared circles, cannot exist. A squared circle cannot exist. There can only be contingent, there cannot only be contingent existences in existence, as they would require something else in order to cause them into existence. There cannot be a finite or infinite series of contingent existences, as such a series would be composed of many differentiated and dependent members. And we're going to come to this in a second, the composition element. But the differentiation and dependent aspect found in the different members of a series of the series indicate that the finite or infinite series itself cannot be necessary. Instead, it must be contingent. Thus, only a necessary existence can cause or ultimately explain why any contingent existences happen to occur. Before we uh, did the break, we asked, what if someone comes and says, well, the universe is all that there is, the, or the multiverse, because the, nowadays, obviously, a, a modern atheist would say something to the effect of, well, I believe in a multiverse. It could, they could say an infinite multiverse. 
Based on what we have spoken about, what would we reply using Avicenna logic in order to disprove this postulation that the universe or a multiverse, infinite or finite, could be all that exists? Who wants to start us up? Mm. Was it one that showing that um, the set of infinite or finite universes are, in a sense, just a, a set of uh, contingencies? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And contingencies are you know, the opposite of uh, necessary things. Yes. So, thus, the needing a cause. Yes. Correct. Yeah, okay. That's the first part. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, needing something which brings it into existence. Yes, which supplies his existence. And contingency. Pardon? And contingency. Yeah, no, in order for it now, the question is, what, C is contingent, right? Mm -hmm. Why, my question, why cannot there just be contingent things in existence, like a universe, for example, or a multiverse? Why cannot, why can, if someone said, the universe is contingent, or, or, or even that the universe is all that there is, how how would you respond to that to them? How would you speak to them? Yeah, if someone says that contingent existence is, is all that there is, then that, that which is contingent is by definition dependent on something else. So if all you have is just contingent things, then really you don't have contingent things, you have necessary things. Why? Because it's like they're not dependent on it. Right, so is what you're saying that if there's only contingent things in existence, like for example, a multiverse, which is a set which includes an infinite multiverse or a finite multiverse, okay. yeah, if you say that set exists which includes a finite or infinite universe and that it depends on itself or is contingent on itself, you're saying that what you're really saying is that there's an independent set. Yes, and it, it would require an independent entity to support it in the first place. Well, they're saying it is the independent entity. But it can't be. Okay, we'll come to why it can't be. Why do you think it can't be, first of all? Yeah. Uh, because you need an independent uh, set to create uh, independence. But they are saying this set itself is dependent on itself. Just the arguments of Hamza. Uh, yeah. You know, the mother can't give birth to herself. Uh, herself. Yeah. Okay, you can make a causation argument. Yeah, so you need outside something outside to support the dependent being. Oh, that's what is there it has to be supported from somewhere. For example, light. There's a light. There has to be a lamp. Yeah. You can't have yeah. a light without a lamp. Okay, this is good. I mean, this is not a, this is not a wrong argument. Yeah. But Ibn Sina does it in a different way. Mm -hmm. So th let me tell you what he says. And I find this is quite clever, actually. It's an argumentum ad absurdum. He says, look, let's say you have a set of infinite contingent things. Infinite universes, let's say. Infinite universes. Well, an infinite multiverse. Yeah. We're putting it in modern part. He doesn't use this language. I'm using it, yeah? Say you've got infinite multi multiverses, universes. And you're saying that that set of an infinite multiverse depends on itself. Is that what you're saying? They say, yes, that's what we're saying. It doesn't need anything else outside. That's what they, they, they are rejecting what you said. They're saying we don't need anything outside. Say, so fine. So what, you, you're, what you're saying is you believe in an independent thing. Because our idea of God is what? idea of God in Islam, for example, is that Allah is Samad. Everything depends upon Him and He depends upon uh, nothing. So, if they say that the, the set of multiverses, which is infinite, is, in, is independent, they are giving a godly quality to that set. You see? So, now they have made that set into a God of some sorts. So, we're saying, fine. We agree on this point that there is an independent thing. But then Ibn Sina says, but it's impossible for that to be the case. Yeah. And the reason why it's impossible for it to be the case, he states, and this is the composition argument, is because, he states, that anything made up of parts is dependent. Anything that is made up of parts is dependent or is contingent. That a multiverse of infinite set is made up of parts. Therefore, the multiverse is, is dependent. Yes, yeah, let me say that again. He says anything that is made up of parts is dependent. dependent. If an infinite 
A finite or infinite multiverse is made up of parts. Therefore, the infinite or finite multiverse is dependent. Now, you can say it this way. You can say anything that is made up of parts is contingent. Mm -hmm. That the infinite multiverse is made of parts. Therefore, it's dependent or it's uh, contingent. Yeah. Let me. Uh, Herbert Davidson, who wrote a book called uh, Proofs of Eternity, is like one of the top guys that has translated like medieval philosophy. He is probably the top, in my opinion. He wrote this book. is is probably the best book that's been written on it. Yeah. He he actually um, writes. I think this is him uh, summarizing it. No, sorry, this is Ibn Sina himself. Ibn Sina states, the ultimate cause cannot be. Uh, um, no, this is something else. You shouldn't. It should. I shouldn't have uh, put that there as that. This is, a, this is a mistake, by the way. Where is this composition element? Composition element is what I've just mentioned to you. The composition element is that there cannot be. He states, parts, which are why? Why? There's two main reasons. The part is dependent, and so if the part is dependent, then the set is dependent on those parts. Number two, he says, the parts must be differentiated. Okay, so you have part one, part two, and part three. And these are differentiated parts. But if you can have parts which are differentiated, then it's conceivable that those parts could be some other way, which means they're contingent. And if it's conceivable that they could be some other way, then that means that they are contingent. For example, if you have a set... And the set is expressed in the following way. Set A, B, C. Set A, B, C can be expressed A, B, C. B, C, A. B, uh, C, A, B. And so on. You see? So you can imagine that in different ways, the set in different ways, the rearrangement of the set. Therefore, it's not necessary. Because something which is necessary can only be expressed in one way. 2 plus 2 equals 4. There's no other way of expressing that. It's a necessary fact. But BCA, ABC, and, and BAC is our different ways of being expressed. So they're dependent, and they can be expressed another way, which contradicts the idea of necessity. Because necessity is something which is not independent and can never be expressed in another way. It's always rigid. It is one way only. So with the composition argument, he says, it's impossible for there to be a set of more than one thing, which is independent or necessary. If you're talking about an infinite multiverse, he would state, therefore it's impossible for an infinite multiverse to be necessary because it can be conceived of in another way, can be rearranged. Mm -hmm. And number two, it's dependent on its individual members. Such that you can take out of it and put into it. Like if, if you have a set, you can literally take things out of that set and put things into that set. But if you can take things out of the set and put things into the set, then how can you put things out and put things into something which is meant to be necessary? It's impossible. Necessary means it's always like that all the time. Yeah. yeah um, what would you do with, like, if it's a sort of deterministic understanding where they say you, you can't really take anything out of the set or put anything in? Like, yeah. Like so th the way we deal with the deterministic objection because some would say we believe in determinism, which is everything is caused by an uninterrupted causal chain, and therefore everything is what it is because, because of the thing that preceded it. We say that if that thing in abstraction, and we're talking about things in abstraction, that, for example, if you say that there's some kind of necessary existence, and that it caused a multiverse, you don't have a problem. Because you're saying that the multiverse is necessary by virtue of the fact that there's a necessary existence which caused it. And so it's, th it's therefore necessary in relationship or in relation to the necessary existence. But in abstraction, it's not necessary, it's contingent. And the proof of that is the fact that it's destructible, it has been generated, it's, it's something which can come out of existence. Like, so it, yani, this thing here cannot, a determinist would say this is determined, yeah? It couldn't have been any other way. But you can only say that because of an antecedent cause, causal chain. They believe in an antecedent causal chain of uninterrupted events. Without such uninterrupted events, this in abstraction cannot be necessary because this, uh, Capricorn, this is, uh, has, is destructible and is generatable. 
can put it out of existence. Anything you can take out of existence, put into existence without contradiction, okay. yeah. yeah, is is mumkin. It is possible. It's contingent. It cannot be necessary. And so, if the multiverse has things inside of it which are parts, then it can be conceived of in a different way. It can be taken. Things can be taken out of it and put into it. Parts of it can be generated. So parts of it can be eliminated, and therefore it's contingent. And the Quran actually alludes to this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَدْ خَلَقَتُكَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَلَمْ تَكُوا شَيْئًا We created you before and you were nothing. You know, we, we create you were nothing. So there's a time where me and you were nothing. And so when Allah says, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْئًا أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ Where they created from nothing or they themselves created themselves. This, if we were nothing and we became something, this shows us that we are generatable and destructible. There's no argument that can possibly be made to indicate that we are not generatable and destructible considering this very fundamental fact that we had a beginning or that we weren't here at one point. There was a time where I didn't exist. A sad time in history, sometime uh, 30 years ago. It was uh, what we call the Dark Ages. <laughs> when I had a, when I'm joking, you know. Uh, but there was a time where I didn't exist. And so I, ca I can't claim to be necessary because there was... Anything which is generatable or destructible is contingent. Mm -hmm. And so going back to the universe, if it's conceivable, or a multiverse, if a multiverse is, or aspects within it, parts of it can be generatable or generated or, destruct, or destroyed, then by necessity, it's contingent. So, how is that what we're saying? Like anything which can be conceived of not existing... Is not necessary. Yes. So then... it's, but this is, uh, this is conceivability. Anything which can conceived of not existing. Uh, what Ibn Rushd and others would say is that anything which can, it has to be, the ontological status must be cosmological. Mm -hmm. yani, uh, it, it can be proven through empiricism. You can make this argument cosmologically. You, th this thing, there's a cosmological reality to it which shows that its essence and nature yeah, uh, means it's possible that it doesn't exist at points. You can destroy it. You can, you can, it, it can come out of existence. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, so, but then it sounds like we've kind of just defined it as such, right? Because it sounds like um, if, you, if you move to God, like the only reason we can't say that God cannot uh, not exist is because of how we've defined God. Okay, so le let's take one step back, yeah? There are two ways of making this argument. You can make this argument ontologically. And in the philosophy of religion, the word ontology means that which is in the mind. A priori, yeah? So like you said, it's an argument from conceivability. Like it's conceivable that a set A, B, C can be expressed A, B, C, C, B, A, and B, A, C. And therefore it can be expressed in different ways. Therefore it's not necessary, the set. Or the expression of the set is not necessary expression. That's an ontological argument. But it's also conceivable uh, cosmologically. When we say it's a cosmological argument, we are talking that which has reference to the cosmos, meaning that which has reference to the universe, the stars, the sun, the earth, something you can put under the microscope, something empiricism. You can use your five senses to detect it. And some have said Ibn Sina is making this argument cosmologically. Like uh, Herbert Davidson said that. Others say, no, in fact, he's making an ontological argument. Uh, Fazl rahman makes that argument. I'm not sure if you know this guy. He's a liberal, uh, but he was, yeah, philosopher. But he was, he, his first uh, love was Ibn Sina, and he wrote a PhD, his PhD. Was, also, uh, Morwedge, we were talking about him, but Pavis uh, Morwedge before him, you know, the, he also thinks that. And uh, others think that. But you can make the argument ontologically, and you can make it cosmologically, or you can make it both. I, and I don't really have a preference. What I'm saying is, if you say that something is generatable or destructible, for example, if we're making this argument cosmological, uh, cosmologically, something is generatable and destructible, and or destructible, then now we are saying it's contingent by virtue of scientific reality, yeah. or by virtue of physical natural reality. Yani through the five senses, empirical reality, this thing can exist and it cannot exist. There was a time where I didn't exist thirty years ago. Yeah, I didn't exist. Remember the Dark Ages? The dark ages. <laughs> and there was a time you didn't exist. And of course you as well. 
75 years ago, there was a time where he didn't exist. <laughs> uh, so, so therefore we're contingent, right? Now, so what we're saying is, what we are defining is, we know that we are arguing for the necessary from the contingent. We are saying that there cannot be just things that cut, that are contingent, that exist like that. There ha in order to, uh, there has to be a supplier, an ultimate supplier of existence. Because otherwise you're just going to have things which depend upon other things, which depend upon other things, which themselves cannot depend on themselves ad infinitum. Does that make sense? Any questions on the, cos com uh, the composition element of this? Any, 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 yeah? Yeah, just, um, I had a discussion with, with like, the pantheists, right? Yes. And people, they believe that everything is God kind of thing. Yes. And so he's denying that, um, that the universe is even made up of parts. He's saying that, like, you know, where do we just kind of see it in this way, but it's not parts. So how would you prove hmm. to that the universe, I guess we don't call it It's a good, it's a very good question. Right, so we need to define what a part is, okay? Now, in the, in the study of muriology, there are about 10 or 11 definitions of part. About 10 or, def or 10 or 11 definitions of part. The way in which I will end up making this argument is that a part is basically what is defined in the vernacular as a piece, a piece of something. A piece is something which is susceptible to uh, as assembly or disassembly, like something which can be attached to something or detached from something, broken up. This is what I mean by piece. And it's important to define a piece or a part in that way, but there are other ways of defining a part. So, for example, if I say, um, I'm part of this class, or it's different from me saying that a part of my dissertation was X, Y, and Z, or a part of my work. You, in the vernacular, it can be used in, in different ways, so you have to be careful what we mean by it. What we mean by it, which is not what Ibn Sina means by it, by the way. I will explain why, Yani. Ibn Sina's definition is actually problematic of what a part is. Al Ghazali mentions that. I'm going to just pre yani, preempt this because I don't want people using a wrong argument. Is that his, his definition of part may include the attributes of God. That's why you have to be careful. So Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah said you have to define it like this. If you want to make this, you know, you go, you go define it like this. And that's why. Um, a part is something, because none of the attributes of God can be attached or detached from God. It's impossible. Okay. So a part is basically a piece. What we, when we say part, we're talking about a piece. If you look in the dictionary of what the word piece means in the dictionary, that's what we mean by a part. But Ibn Sina, it could be argued that his definition of part includes the godly attributes. And in fact, this was not just Ibn Taymiyyah. Al-Ghazali attacked him for this as well. In fact, in his Tehafut al the incoherence of the philosophers, uh, Al Ghazali massively attacked him. On your point of the universe could be it doesn't it's not composed of parts. I don't think anyone can make that. It's a merely logically redundant argument. It's an impossible argument to say the universe has no parts, unless he's defining part in a way which is merely logically impossible. I mean, no one would define it like that. People who are pantheists in the past, the most prominent of them, like Spinoza, he was a pantheist. I'm not sure if you know who Spinoza is. He was a very he was. Uh, heavyweight philosopher in the 17th century, 16th, 17th century. He existed at the same time, I think, as Leibniz. And he basically said God is everywhere. He believed it. And he was excommunicated from the Jewish uh, community because of that. He's, they, they said no to Wahdat al-Wujud. Now some Muslims are saying, some Muslims are accepting this and speaking about it. But even the Jews said, this guy, forget him, he's finished. Uh, but Spinoza is well known for being uh, like a well-known pantheist. But he didn't express it in that way either. Like... Intellectual pantheists don't say the universe is not made of parts. They just say the universe. If God is basically this was Spinoza's argument. Spinoza said if God is infinite, then he is everywhere. But that's false. I mean, we don't say God is infinite. We say God is infinitely, and then we added a subject or uh, an object. God is infinitely merciful. God is infinitely powerful. God is infinitely whatever. Saying God is infinite is actually a meaningless statement. What, is, what do you mean infinite? Infinite in what? I'm waiting for you to finish the sentence. For, because Spinoza conflated this or equated it with infinite in uh, occupying space or something like that. But the problem is if we say God is everywhere, then he's in, within the universe. And if the universe is made out of parts, then God is made up of parts as well. He's contingent. <laughs> you, you know, you've got issues here. 
which is why uh, yani, th this argument can be problematic. But if he says that the universe is not made up of parts, you say what myriological understanding? Myriology, yeah, is the study of parts and holes. That's what myriology means. If if you say that it's, there's no parts or the universe is not made of parts, the first question you ask him is what is your definition of a part, and what correspondence does it have with any of the definitions of a part known in the literature? And if he says this, it corresponds with X definition, we say, well, actually, this definition, which we're talking about, pieces, the universe is made up of pieces. Because this is differentiated from this. My finger is different. So you say this index finger is differenti differentiated from this middle finger here. Yeah, but don't just show him the middle finger like that. This thumb is differentiated from the index finger and so on. So these are different. Are they not? Yeah, yeah they're different. Now, he, he can't tell, tell you they are the same. Because if, the, and this is what Ibn, uh, Ibn Sina says actually, in his arguing why a necessary being can only be one, and I'll add this to this because it's interesting. He says if something is necessary, okay, if something is necessary, it cannot be any other way. Say you have necessary being one, God one, and you have necessary being two, God two, yeah, and God two is differentiated from God one in way X. Let's just call it way X. Now, the way X, which differentiates God 1 from God 2, does one of two things. Either it annuls the fact that either of them are the necessary existence, or that both of them are the necessary existence. Because if we say that way X is uh, specific to God 2, then that's a differentiating thing. And if it's differentiated, it can be conceived of in another way. And anything that can be conceived of in another way is contingent. Which means God 2 is not actually a God 2 after all. God 2 is contingent because he has something which differentiates him which, which could be conceived of in another way and anything that can be conceived of in another way is contingent. Trinity. Exactly. The Trinity is a great example of this. This nullifies the Trinity from being true, actually. Uh, because how can you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and they are different? If they are different, if, if Jesus is God and he's necessary and the Son is God and he's necessary and the Holy Spirit is God and necessary, then how can you have three things which are necessary but are different? It's, if you're necessary, it's impossible to be different from something else which is necessary. Because anything differentiating a necessary existence from another necessary existence implies contingency on either of those entities' uh, part or both of, their both of them are not necessary then. Okay? We're nearly finished, guys. I know it's been... Uh... Now, there's, there's one more thing I need to go through with you, Yeah? It's important. I'm going to read out, first of all, the slide. I think this is from uh, Davidson. So there are different kinds of set. Yeah, you can imagine a linear set. You can, you, can, you can imagine a linear set. You can imagine a circular set. And you can imagine a finite set. And you can imagine an infinite set. These are really the exhaustive options of what kind of sets we're talking about in existence. Now, I'm not going to read this out, actually. In fact, you can read that out on your own time. I'm going to tell you what, what's going on. Imagine you have a set, yeah? And the set is A, B, C. A, and it's linear. Okay, there's no problem here. If the set is A, B, C, then A is the cause of B, B is the cause of C. So the first, the, 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 the primary cause of everything is what? A. Problem solved. A is the cause of everything. We don't even need discussion. But someone can say, well, what if A caused B, B caused C, and C caused A? And Avicenna says this is impossible because that means causes would be the dis effects would be the distant causes of themselves. So A is causing itself, basically. Now we're going back to a mother giving birth to herself. Right? Well, Hamza's also famous line. You know, so. There cannot be a circular set because if you have a circular set, if it's A causes B and B causes C and C causes A, that means C is causing A. And if C is causing A, then the, the, you have causes which are their own effects, which is impossible, he states. Now, nowadays you have something called retrocausation. We're going to talk about that in the objection section. They say, can something cause itself in right? the grandfather paradox? And we'll, we'll go through it. In fact, I've made a video about this, but we can go through it in more detail when we talk about the objections. But basically, this is a logically impossible. 
for something to cause itself. So we've dealt with it because you've got two kinds of set. You've got the finite set and you've got what? The infinite set. The finite set is divided into two different types. The linear one, which says A, B, C. A causes B, B causes C. So A causes B and C, right? That's done. That, 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 proves, that proves our point, that there was a first cause. You've got the circular set, which says A causes B, B causes C, and C causes A. And he says that's impossible. And we've seen how that's impossible. It, so we've exhausted what? We've exhausted the finite possibility. Now he goes to the infinite set. Now he doesn't say that there's an infinite regress. Is it, an infinite regress is impossible. By the way, it's very important. Avicenna does not say an infinite regress is impossible of things. He says an infinite regress of causes is impossible. This is a point where he, he, he differentiates himself from Al-Ghazali, or Al-Ghazali differentiates himself from him. Because Al-Ghazali argues that there cannot be an infinite number of anything in the real world. Avicenna doesn't make this argument. He says, fine, let's assume that there is an infinite number of contingent things in the set. Let's assume that. Now, how does he show that it's impossible for there to be an infinite number of th things in the set? He doesn't, he doesn't make an argument from infinity, like Hilbert. Hilbert's, have you heard of David Hilbert's example? The hotel, the hotel example. Like if, if you had a, a, a hotel with an infinite amount of people staying there, if one more person comes in, then with, what, would be, what would happen? This is a Ghazalian type argument, by the way, right? The idea that an infinite, a number, an infinite actuality cannot exist in the real world. He doesn't make this argument. Ibn Sina makes the argument that, and even if you say for the sake of argument, there's an infinite, let's just say there's an infinite regress. Basically, he says, fine, infinite regress, no problem. That's what Ibn Sina says. And he says, the problem with the infinite regress is, is made up of different parts. And anything that is made up of different parts is contingent. And therefore, the infinite regress is, in, is contingent. So he doesn't, he doesn't want to fight the fact that it's, he's letting them have it. He's letting them have it. He's saying, fine. For the sake of art, it's called argumentum ad absurdum. You can say for the fact, it's no problem. There's an infinite regress of uh, this uh, dependent thing. Uh, sorry, um, uh, things, contingent things. However, because it's made up of different parts and because it's, they're all contingent, therefore, they can't be necessary. That's how he argues against it, through composition. What's referred to as terkeep. He doesn't argue it through it. To, uh, he doesn't attack infinity in the real world. He only attacks in, an infinite amount of causes, which is exactly what Aristotle, by, by the way, believes in as well. And by the way, Ibn Taymiyyah as well. Ibn Taymiyyah believed in something called Hawadith la awala laha. He believed Allah kept creating perpetually into the past, which would indicate an infinite regress of things in the past. He doesn't see that it's a logical impossibility for there to be an infinite regress of things in the past. For our purposes, this might be useful because you might say, well, if someone is so insistent on an infinite multiverse theory, we say, fine, you can have your infinite multiverse theory, but this doesn't do anything to what? To prove necessity. Because in fact, if it's made up of parts, then it's still contingent. So composition, you see the importance of composition in this argument. Composition is actually a staple part of this. If you don't have composition, you don't have the argument. The composition argument is a necessary uh, part of this argument. Okay, now uh, I don't want to go on for too long because uh, you know I know this can be problematic. Uh, summary: We have gone through sorry about that. We have gone through today. We have gone through Avicenna's argument, the main argument. Now the argument, um, as we've said, talks about how did we start? Actually, let me ask you guys: How did we start the argument? Let's summarize it. Contingencies and necessities. Uh, yeah. How, what's the first part of the argument? What did we say? Yeah, we said that there is no doubt that there is, there is, Great. There is existence. Yeah, there, there's no doubt there's existence. All right. What's, what kind of taksimet? What kind of categorization of existence are there? So we have necessary existences. Okay. Contingent existences. And? And there's also impossible. But if something is impossible, it doesn't exist. Right, like what? Uh, like a square triangle. Okay, oh, fine, because square to square is more conventional. Right? You don't have to try and be different, huh? <laughs> okay, all right, no problem. What, what, uh, what else was the second part? Someone else, someone, someone else. Second part. Now, don't, uh, how about you, Maaz? You, yeah, yeah. So we've got the, so we've got yeah. contingent existences and necessary existences. So yeah, from there we said, um, uh, if there was a set of uh, contingent ex ex existence, uh, existences, 
uh, it would uh, it would uh, necessarily have to have something uh, a necessary existence to explain it. If uh, if we argued that uh, the uh, set of uh, existence itself uh, was infinite, uh, so we could separate the set of existences, a contingent existence. We could make it could either be infinite or finite. Yes. Uh, if, if it was Let's stick with the finite. Just with the finite by itself. The finite can be separated into two different types, which are they? Yeah, uh, it could have a necessary existence within it. And yeah, okay. It, uh, the necessary existence would explain it. But what, does he say that it's possible to have a necessary existence within it? Or does he say, or does he argue ad absurdum? Uh, I think he just said uh, if, it, if it existed, uh, the necessary existence would explain it. No. Right, right, he did, but he said it's impossible. Oh, I, I, okay, yeah. Right, right, because the set of... Uh, the, and is there anything that could be within this, the set of contingent existence? It, does the set of can a contingent existence exist outside the set of contingent existences? No, uh, uh, by definition, a set of contingent ex existence, existences means uh, all the contingent existences that exist. Give me an example with uh, even in the odd numbers. Yeah, to, uh, say, uh, there could be, to say there could be an odd number outside of all the set uh, of uh, outside of the set of all odd numbers uh, is basically a meaningless statement. Great. And what, what, what were you saying? You gave a cosmological, can you give him the microphone? It, for example, we gave an example in this room. Okay. If we said there's a set of all uh, books, what does that exclude, for example? Uh, tables, chairs, sofas. Yes. And so what, what can you add to this? How does that rely, um, relate to contingency and necessity? So when we say that there's a set of contingent existences, what does that exclude from it? The, uh, anything that's not uh, con contingent. <coughs> yeah. On the same red risk. And yeah. the second thing is uh, necessary. Br brilliant. Fantastic. Let's get to the other side of the room. Now tell me now, we, we talked about two different types of set. We started with the uh, finite set. We said that you, can, you have a set of um, contingent existences, the finite set can be two types. What are the two types of finite set that you can have? Think A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B. Yeah, so linear, uh, linear and All right, and what does he say about linear, Mehdi? A equals B and B equals C, so A is the beginning. Yeah, so it's, it's, we've, we have... Uh, it's we got in our line of reason. We fulfilled the object, right? Yeah. Fantastic, brilliant. What if it's... Uh, if it's circular. Yeah. So A equals B, B equals C, then cause A, then it's impossible because it's uh, the causes. Uh, so, so what, why is it impossible? Because there's an infinite amount of causes. Which is no, no, we haven't gone to infinite yet. We're still in finite, remember? If A equals B and B equals C and C equals A, what's the, what's the contradiction here? So you have like, things causing Go on, go on. Can give it give it to him? Yeah, so basically things are not causing themselves. So if you have A, so like A is causing B and B is causing C, and if C is causing A, then A is causing itself. Brilliant. And that's impossible, right? Yeah. Logically impossible. Now, let's since you've still got the microphone, talk, talk to me about infinite uh, infinite ex infinite uh, sets. What would Avicenna say about them, which is different to Al Ghazali? What would he what would Avicenna say, which is different to Al Ghazali in relation to infinite infinity in the real world? Yeah, so um, you can see that doesn't have an issue with there being infinity. What what specific problem does he have? Uh, um, right, yeah, a of, 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 of causes. Right? causes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he has a problem with it. And who is that the same as? Ancient philosopher before him? Uh, Aristotle. Aristotle had the same issue, right? So he had the same reasoning with Aristotle. Now, what if it's an infinite set, how does he argue ad absurdum to show that it's an impossible for an infinite set of, say, I'm bringing modern pilots here, multiverses, infinite multiverses. How is that impossible to be a necessary existence? What, this, the whole set itself? Yes. Um, because it goes into composition. Yes. So mm. the set is composed of parts, so anything which is composed of parts is itself contingent. Okay, great. And why? Uh, because it relies on the parts to constitute the whole. And what are parts differentiated from? Holes. Right. And... Um, Say you got part A, B, and C. Yeah. What was uh, what is um, a factor of differentiation here? Part B is relying on part A to for contingency. Well, well actually, the, the whole the whole is relying on A, B, and C, yes. but is is A and B is A the same as B or is it different? Uh, 
Right. So if parts are differentiated, that means they're what? Contingent. That means they're contingent, right? Yes. Now, what he would also say is that the expression of that set, mm -hmm. it can be expressed differently. ABC can be expressed CBA or whatever. Okay. So what does this, why is this different from something necessary? Because it can, it can only be explained one way. Good, yeah. So give me an example of a necessary fact which can only be explained in one way. Uh, one plus three is four. Okay, let's make it two plus one two for the sake of So why is, two why is two plus two equals four any different? Why don't we say two plus two equals four equals God then? So if you're saying that there's more than one necessary thing, two plus two equals four is necessary, and you're saying there's a necessary existence, so what, there's more than one God? No, no, not necessarily, actually. Why? In the, in, the con in the capacity of two plus two is four. We're not saying that, in its own capacity. What do you mean by that? For example, um, two cameras are two cameras. It doesn't mean two cameras become like a, a one camera and one chair. So in the capacity of two things... You're definitely onto something. You're definitely on the right tracks. Can you give him? Yeah, let's see if we can solve this problem. Um, is it just because two plus two plus four isn't something that actually exists? So it's not really... Uh, well, that's disputable. Some would say it does. I mean, Plato would say that it exists in the land of uh, in the world of forms. A, Plato, a Platonist would say that it does exist. Okay, the answer to this question, okay, is that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a necessary fact. Yeah. We are not talking about necessary facts. There's many, there's an ultimate number yeah. of, we are talking about necessary what? Existence. Existences. Yeah, well, it, yeah. yeah. So there's only one necessary existence. There are many necessary facts. Mm -hmm. Necessity can be, there's, there's different types of necessity, but there's only one necessary existence, okay. which supplies the rest of existence with existence. Okay, questions, yeah. I've got one question. Um, yeah. So we went. We were talking about um, anything which can. Uh, sorry, um, anything can. Anything that is conceived in another way means that it's contingent, right? Yes. So, like essentially, like that's because of our definition of necessary, right? Well, yeah. Well, on this point, to be very d precise, anything that can be conceived of in any other way in abstraction. Right. What does that mean? In abstraction, in abstraction without reference to anything else. Okay. So what does that mean? What I mean is. In abstraction, for example, if I say I'm going to analyze this phone or this key or myself in abstraction, I'm saying I'm, I'm removing myself from any causes prior to me and I'm only analyzing myself. So if, I, if, someone, if a determinist says, well, you are determined because there's an antecedent or an uninterrupted causal chain that has made you do everything you're doing now, you're a puppet, it's cosmic ventriloquism, yeah? I will reply and say, well, you are analyzing me with what, in, 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 in conjunction with the uninterrupted causal chain. Yeah. But if you, ab if you abstract me, there's nothing within me, there's no quality within me, which supplies myself with continued existence. There's no necessary quality in, within me. Because I am destructible and what? Generatable. I have had an inception. It's conceivable that I can come out of existence, although that will be the dark ages again, <laughs> and so on. Go on. Yeah, um, so, like, it sounds like we're talking about, like, um, again, I, I feel like it's, it's all, like, hinged on definitions, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, so, like, how can we prove that when we say that something necessarily exists, it also means that it necessarily exists that way and not in any other way? I can only exist in one way, and not in any other way. When you prove the necessary existence, this is a good question. If something is a necessary existence, then everything about the necessary existence is necessary. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you basically prove the existence of the necessary existence, then any, any way you describe, i.e. the attributes of the necessary existence, must also be necessary by extension. They can't be contingent. Because if, if, if a necessary existence has a contingent attribute, that would render the, the entire existence as uh, con contingent. It's impossible for a necessary existence to, be, to have an attribute which is contingent, based on the fact that it's necessary in the first place. So necessity precedes, uh, necessity cannot be succeeded with any kind of contingency, because any subsequent description of contingency to a, an otherwise necessary existence would nullify the uh, necessity of that necessary existence in the first place. Yeah, so we're talking about like the identity of that necessary existence, which is like separate to the actions that it may do, right? Mm. 
So like, the, the identity of the necessary existence can only be conceived in that one way. Whereas the actions... The attributes... Yeah. The actions now are... Now, the, the attributes are an extension of the attributes yeah. of the necessary existence. If we affirm attributes. Yeah. And obviously, logically, you'd have to, you'd have to do legwork in order to affirm um, action. Because now we're, we're, we're skipping ahead. Yeah. But everything about the necessary existence has to be necessary. Yeah. Otherwise, it's contingent. Do you see? But that, doesn't that uh, get rid of the idea of will? Alright, in a way, if, if you look at it just from a deterministic perspective, we, we actually have uh, studies on this, we have, sorry, um, sessions on this. We have a session on Qadr, free will and determinism. There's a whole session on it, and in fact I wrote something on that as well. For... I mean about the will of God in itself. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. So this is, yeah, good. The will of God is because it's the attribute, not the will of human beings, right? The will of God is because since it's an attribute of the necessary existence, it must also be what? Necessary. necessary. Every decision, choice that God has made could not have been any other way. It's based on what? It's based on his infinite knowledge. On we're gonna to come to this, infinite knowledge and infinite wisdom. And since his wisdom and knowledge is perfect, you couldn't conceive mm -hmm. that the results would be any other way. It's the best possible choice that can be made. It's necessary. So is it even possible to conceive that God couldn't have chosen it? Say that again. So is it even impossible to conceive that God couldn't... Could and, yeah, yeah. It's impossible to... Con any choice that God has made, it's impossible to conceive that it could have been any other way. So then you're basically denying that God has uh, will. No. We're saying that he has will based on knowledge. And since the knowledge is perfect, the will is also a connection, is connected to that. In fact, classically, they, they divide it into these kinds of things. Three different types of attributes. Ahl Sunnah, let's say, yeah? We, we have the intrinsic attributes of God, the Sifat al Then you have the will, which stands alone, by the way, as a category. And then you have the Af'al of Allah, which are the verbal attributes of Allah, or the um, action-based things of Allah. So the will is based on the perfect knowledge of God. Since the knowledge is perfect, and the will is based on the knowledge, what God decides to do is always going to be based on that perfect knowledge. So it's inconceivable that God does something which opposes his intrinsic attributes. Yeah. So, for example, this, uh, and this is controversial, I mean, but I'm just giving you my view on it. This is a theological view, right? Some say God can lie. Some say that. I'm not sure if you see the, the, yeah, the so debate cool. between the, the, the metal, not the metal, the, the, the abandis and the brelvis. I'm not sure if you've seen this or not. Yeah. And, and in fact, I don't want to go into details about it, but if you say God can lie, then you, I mean, I saw one, one particular person say, well, if you're saying God can lie, the Quran can be a whole liar and then you're in big trouble. But that's not, that's the consequence of the problem. The problem is bigger than that, because if you say God can lie, then he can act in contradiction to his perfect attribute. The, the same reason why God, it's impossible for God to lie is the same reason why he can't become a man. Because it, it contradicts the intrinsic attributes of God. Anything which contradicts the intrinsic attributes of, of God is the equivalent of a squared circle. It's impossible. It's, it's a meaningless statement. So if you, if you say God could lie, then it seems to be God. No, it's, 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 impossible. it's an impossible thing. Okay. It's like saying, can, God, can a necessary being be contingent? No, by definition it can't be. And likewise, a necessary will cannot produce contingent results. So if, if someone was to say, for example, that... Um, the, it appears based on stuff like that, but it appears based on what you're saying that the will is dependent on the knowledge. So you have the attributes yeah. of Allah which are dependent on other ones. The word attribute would be very problematic. Uh, dependent would be very problematic. Uh, it's, it's, it, the word would be used manut or it's connected to, or it's, um, this is the kind of word you'd use. Dependent would suggest there's some kind of dependent relationship between the uh, between um, between God's attributes, as if they are different entities, and the, the, depending on each other, yeah, which uh, is impossible. Isn't the idea of a necessary will a bit of a contradiction? Why? It's necessary. It, it, it doesn't. Uh, doesn't it uh, refute the idea of uh, choice? choice yeah. All right. So, what is choice? Is the ability to choose A over B. Right. right. Okay. So God has a limited set of choices that He can choose from. No, no. I'm, no, there are some things which are impossible, but those are not things. You said you, you, you in your statement you said that God has a limited set of things to choose from. No, 
God can choose anything which is a thing. God has all, and in the Quran it says, he's, he's over all things powerful. Anything that God doesn't choose from or cannot choose from are not things in the first place. It's not a shape. It's not even a shape. So can God create a rock so heavy that he can't lift? That rock doesn't. That rock is an impossible existence. That rock is impossible. That the existence of that rock is is is, is similar to the existence of a squared circle. So you asking, can God create a rock so heavy that he can't lift? Is the equivalent of asking, can God create a squared circle? Which means, can God create something which cannot be created? Can God create something which doesn't, ex which cannot come into existence? Can God create nothing? <laughs> well, can God create something which is meaningless? It's, it's not a meaningful statement. It's basically not a meaning, meaningful statement. In the same way, can God do something which is uh, contrary to his attribute, intrinsic attributes? Can God do imperfect things? That's impossible. These are impossible existences. We're talking about, now remember we talked about the three categories. Impossible existence, contingent and necessary. This belongs in the category of impossible existences. Therefore, they're not even things. They're not even things to talk about. They're impossibly conceived and impossibly manifested and impossibly materialized. Meaning they're impossible in every way. Just because you can say something, it doesn't mean that thing has meaning. And so the, the idea of a rock so heavy that you can't lift is something you can say with words, but you can't mean with, with uh, semantics. It's a meaningless statement. Just because you can construct a sentence in English or in other languages, it doesn't mean that, and it's intelligible grammatically, it doesn't mean that sentence is intelligible and coherent um, logically. It's a logically incoherent thing. Does that make sense? So, theologically, we would say that God, doing everything that God does, is within the scope of what is possible. And because it's within the scope of what is possible, and it's based on his perfect knowledge, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's predicated on his uh, necessary attribute, then it becomes necessary as well. And we're going to cover this, inshallah, in more detail. And what that thing, the status of the ontological status of it is as follows. It's mumkinun li nefsihi wajibun li Which means it's possible in and of itself and necessary because in connection with something else, in this case, the will of God, which is necessary itself. That's the ontological status of everything in existence aside from God. Any other questions before we conclude? No, okay. Wajazakumullah khairan. And hopefully this was a long session, but it was an important one. Uh, thank you for joining. In the next session, we're going to be talking more about people's reactions, Ghazali's disputation, uh, Ibn Rushd, Ibn Taymiyyah. And we're going to talk about more about the parts and attribute distinction. And we're going to be talking more about why is it that's material thing? Why can't the universe be a material thing? Cannot be the necessary existence. We're going to be talking about Ibn Rushd and his problem with the modal categories. And he defined them in a very specific way. We're going to be talking about Don Scotus, who's a very, is a heavyweight uh, Christian scholar. Uh, probably at the same level of Aquinas, quite frankly. But he was just not given the same notoriety. And Aquinas himself. Uh, we're going to be seeing how these people, in his third way, because he went five ways of proving God's existence. In his third way, he actually took this, uh, this, uh, this, this argument and used it himself. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.